I'm going to use the, the case of the um, 2010, uh, well, I'm going to talk about Haiti. And so the classic thing when people talk about disasters in Haiti in the last decade or so has been the 2010 earthquake, which is incredibly devastating. And, uh, and we have not covered earthquakes in detail yet, so we will. So this is just sort of high level, not talking about the specifics of, of what exactly happened. But um, suffice it to say, uh, what, we, what we have uh, in the case of the country of Haiti is chronic instability, all kinds of horrible government, um, et cetera. Add on top of that natural disasters, and what we have is a failed state, in effect, um, unfortunately. Um, and so these disasters aren't just some theoretical thing. They aren't, they aren't just important for our, our ecosystem or for the people living there, but they really have long um, tails, long consequences to all kinds of folks. So really, disasters are a form of a stress on the system, right? Whether that's an ecological system or a human social system. Um, if we have really robust healthy ecosystems and we have a disaster come in, it'll obviously have some impacts, it'll be bad for a bit, but the system will bounce back. But if our systems are not well designed ahead of time, and if they're not really well prepared ahead of time, um, these disasters can be, um, you know, <laughs> disastrous. They can, they can be um, ending to that system. And so, um, so let's talk really quickly about uh, Haiti. And as with everything, right, um, we, we tend to like, like, so you guys are working on your case studies right now. We tend to go, oh my gosh, hey, what happened here and run to the disaster? And that's a natural thing. But we should always remember to take a breath, step back, and look at the history. So go back to what was going on before that date. Not just that date forward, but that date in reverse. And so in the context of Haiti, it's been plagued by a lot of um, poor governance and a lot of corrupt governance. Um, and so, so this stems from a whole variety of things. It stems from this history of slavery uh, that was um, uh, enacted in the wake of Christopher Columbus uh, setting foot on this, on this island. Um, but it, all, it wasn't just the fact that people were enslaved and everything, but it was really what we chose, how we responded to that, that slavery. And so in this case, this is uh, basically 1825, and this is the then leader of Haiti, essentially being forced to um, pay reparations to France for freeing themselves, from liberating themselves. Um, and so let's talk about briefly Haiti. Uh, you don't need to write this down, but just, just overview. Columbus lands, um, and, and Haiti is part of the island that, you know, it, it's on one part, the other part is the Dominican Republic of Hispaniola. Um, and this becomes Spain's first foothold in the, in the Western world, right? So Spain's going to make its colony here and do all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, doesn't go super well. And after, uh, after a bit of time, um, uh, France takes over. And France uh, um, becomes the uh, uh, colonial power in that area. And then it, it, you know, 1700s is very profitable. So half of the world's coffee. Uh, comes from Haiti in this in this time um, in the 1700s. Uh, they also uh, produce a huge amount of indigo to, to dye things blue, and then of course sugar, which is part of the triangle trade, rum and all that all that stuff in, in the slave trade, etc. Um, unrest, unrest, unrest amongst the enslaved peoples, especially towards the latter half of the 1700s, and um, and eventually uh, there's a, a successful uprising. Um, and so uh, we have the, the first um, successes of the slave rebellion. Um, that first leader, leader Toussaint, is, is eventually um, uh, tricked and captured and taken back to France where he dies in jail. Um, but uh, his, um, uh, his, 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 um, um, uh, lieutenant basically takes over and eventually um, comes on in and uh, uh, heads uh, this new country and uh, it, it was looking good. Um, France is so bloodied by this, they lose, because so, this is a very profitable colony for them. Um, they're so bloodied by that, they um, uh, decide that France is going to pull out of having colonies in the new world. 
And so that's it. And so including all their colonies on mainland North America. And so at the time, President Jefferson is like, hey, I really want to buy the city of New Orleans because that's like that, that's at the mouth of the Mississippi. It's really you know, politically important, economically important. And he was trying to buy that. And then because of the success of the Haitian Rebellion, um, uh, Napoleon's like, uh, can you just want to buy the whole thing? And he's like, what? He's like, yeah. And so we doubled the size, the, the doubled the size of the territorial landmass with that one deal, right? Um, so huge, huge thing for our country and, and, and the continent and everything. Um, and so then, uh, and then uh, 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 Toussaint's uh, uh, lieutenant um, uh, basically uh, completes the revolution and and takes over. And this is the first um, and really the only successful um, country that liberates themselves from slavery and, and manages to hold on to power. Um, so it, it's a, a monumental thing in the New World. And then, and then of course, uh, so um, very similar, I think, to what's going on right now with um, uh, Israel and the Palestinian situation and all that. Um, you know, the enslaved peoples totally persecuted uh, understand all that. But as they're winning, towards the end, they go on what people now call a, a genocide. But basically, they go and they slaughter almost all the white folks that are there, right? Except for Polish folks or German folks. German folks didn't have, German folks didn't have uh, slaves, refused to have slaves. And the Polish folks joined the rebellion early on. Everybody else was slaughtered. And that got all this attention. And that freaks out the US. And the US says, oh, we have all these slaves. I don't like that anymore. So we initially, John Adams supports the revolution, supports the rebellion. Freedom, all the things that we say we believe in as a country. Then this happens and people freak out. And so, um, so then we, the US, pull our support. So we stop financially supporting Haiti. So then they get in this huge bind. Um, they're trying to join the world community, and they're having problems. And so France is really PO'd, right? So France comes back, kind of tries to, uh, you know, um, a couple times, you know, come back and everything, and, and take them back, and they, they, get, they get their butt kicked. Eventually, they come back in uh, 1824, and they sail into the harbor with a, I forget, oh, seven warships or something like that, and like hundreds and hundreds of cannons and stuff, and they're like, yeah, so by the way, you took our property, you took our slaves, you took our land, and you gotta pay us for that. And so they forced this reparations, right? So we're, we're dealing with reparations now in our country, trying to figure out how, how to do that, should we do that, how, how do we do that, et cetera. Um, so France basically forced that on the Haitian people at the point of a gun, so they agreed to it, and that sends them into this massive, um, I don't wanna say death spiral, but, but really, really bad times that they, they've yet to recover from. So they have to pay for all the, the plantation lands that were quote unquote taken from the French people, et cetera. And that amounts to something like $21 billion Haiti ends up paying to France all the way up until 1947 until France said, yeah, you paid us back and stopped payments. And that included the first year, the amount of payment they had to make was six times their national gross domestic product. So huge amounts of money we're talking. This sends the country into this cycle that is relevant to, the, to us in disaster. So this sends them into this very deep poverty and, um, and, and it became and remains the poorest country in all the Americas, by far, by far. Um, and then, um, and then th with, with that poverty, people are, it's hard to govern, don't have money, people get upset, so it's a series of, of not the most stable governments. So the U.S. 1915 says, "Oh, we have some, we have interests here. So we want to, we want to protect our assets and our interests and everything. So we invade, we 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 invade um, the country, and are there for a couple decades. And then we pull out, but we maintain a lot of fiscal uh, influence, right? So we 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 pull the the war troops out, but we keep the the institutional troops, if you will, in there." Uh, super destabilized. In the wake of World War II, um, we elect this Duvalier regime, right? So Papa Doc, baby, Papa Doc's a dad. He dies in 71 and his son steps in. Horrible, horrible, evil terrorists, authoritarians, dictators, all the bad stuff that we, we know happens in these dictatorships happen there. 
you know, what wealth the country have you know, goes into these guys' coffers, that kind of stuff. Finally, we get to the 1990s, and it seems like, okay, maybe, we can, maybe we're coming out of this funk. And so um, uh, a Catholic priest, former Catholic priest, um, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, gets, gets elected, and it's the first truly free election in Haiti's modern history. So it's like, okay, great. So now we have these problems, but with help from the U.S. and other countries, we're, we're having some elections, and they're free and fair, and all that kind of stuff. We elect this, this guy who seems like he's going to be a you know, champion of reform and get things together, et cetera, worried about the poor, all that good stuff. Um, and then he's very quickly overthrown by the military. So a coup d'etat happens. So he gets kicked out. He runs to the U.S. Um, and then, then President Clinton says, this is not good. Like, we don't want to have dictatorships on our, on our doorstep. So um, we send in um, a bunch of troops. And uh, and restore Aristide as the as the you know rightful ruler and everybody in the world claps. It's all great, and then we um, you know get busy with other things and, and don't pay as much attention. There's all kinds. I'm simplifying all this. Uh, stuff happens. Um, Aristide is far from a perfect individual. I'm not trying to imply that, um, but basically he's again forced out in 2004, right? But now the the war on terrorism is is going full board. We're really busy with other stuff, right? We can't be bothered with with this stuff. Um, we're hunting Osama bin Laden, all that kind of stuff. We send uh, you, we send in a, a detachment of U.S. Marines to stabilize stuff because it's getting really chaotic. It's unclear who's in control. Um, and then very quickly, it's like, hey, we got that under control, but we don't want to be here. We don't want to be looking like any more the Americans coming in telling these countries what to do. So it's very quickly handed over to a UN international um, a stabilization force, uh, multilateral peacekeepers and that kind of stuff. So they move in. Doesn't go well. Lots of problems. So, I mean, disasters have been playing th out throughout this time. I've just been skipping through to, to do this really quickly. But, but suffice it to say, in the wake of that most recent UN era, we have um, a bunch of problems that would be a problem for any country, right? So, so these storms cause problems in the US. But in a country that has very few resources and very little capacity to respond to disasters, it's really hard. So this satellite shows uh, Hurricane Gustav and Tropical Storm Hannah. I, again, we haven't talked about the, the details of how these things form. That'll come later. But, but suffice to say, big storm, big storm. There's Haiti right there. That's being covered by bands of rain from um, uh, Hannah. And basically, over the course of three weeks, we have four major storms strike Haiti, strike, strike the area. Um, the first one, really new, with, with flooding, really damages the, the food systems for the people there, especially rice and bananas are, are really hurt. Um, ten folks are killed. Um, and then on, you know, a week or so later comes Hurricane Gustav, really widespread flooding. And as we've seen with our recent rains, um, you know, most recently here in, in Southern California, a uh, little bit of rain, okay, that's a problem. But we have rain on top of rain, on top of rain, on top of rain, and eventually those soils get saturated. Then when you have even just a bit more rain, that's when we get the landslides, mud flows, all that kind of stuff. And so that's what happens here in the, with the second storm that comes through, 77 people are dead. Um, and then, and that, that's bad, and then it really starts to go out of control here. When Hurricane Hannah comes by, don't even know how many people are dead. They stop counting after 527, but, but at least, you know, 500 folks dead, um, probably a lot, lot more. And then a couple days later, Hurricane Ike comes by and, and, and comes through. And so this is, so this, this is one of the um, three largest cities in Haiti, and it's essentially completely cut off. After this final storm, the last bridge washes out, and there's no way to even get to, terrestrially get to people. You have to fly people in in a helicopter. It's the only way to get to folks. Um, and essentially, the city is basically gone, is basically erased underwater and debris and stuff. Um, and, and then everybody is like, what the heck, right? We need water. We need food. Where is my government, as, you would, as we all would say when, when we're in these stressful times? And then the government is saying, where the hell is the international community to help us? We're, we're swamped here. We need assistance. And it just um, is this big, huge blow. And, and so that's really bad. Um, for scale, for scale, this is how big Haiti is compared to us. So um, 
If you look down here, so Haiti is about 20,000, about 28,000 square kilometers. That's a little bit bigger than LA, Santa Barbara, Ventura counties together. So we're about, about the size of our three counties was, is what we're talking about in terms of the, the country uh, land mass. Um, uh, about, about 11 million people or so in that, in that area. So relatively high density of folks. Already stressed, now with even fewer resources, people still need to eat, right? People still need water, still need to eat. And so there's, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, disease outbreaks, et cetera. Unfortunately, cholera, unfortunately brought in from some of the UN peacekeepers, which the UN originally said that didn't come from us and it's now been pretty much definitively shown it came from some of the Nepalese, uh, I think it was troops that were there. Um, so unintentional, of course, but nevertheless, it, it, it further breeds distrust of the UN. Like, what, these people are bringing disease here? Like, what, you know, supposed to be helping us? Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a Google, I just took a screenshot from Google Earth this morning. And so on the left is Haiti. Uh, on the right is the Dominican Republic. And what looks different is the green, and that's the amount of vegetation. So in Haiti, this is massive deforestation. Um, that's gone on across the uh, m large swaths in the vast majority of the country. Um, and this is the most recent uh, high resolution um, uh, analysis of it um, that uh, you know, shows that we only have about a third of the remaining, uh, well, as, of, as of a decade ago, we only have about a third of the remaining um, forest, uh, forested area. What's going on? This stuff on the right. So what's going on is people are chopping down the trees to turn those trees into charcoal, and that's the primary fuel source for people for heating, but especially for cooking. And so that's what's driving all this. And the estimates are at the rate we're deforesting this stuff, there won't be any forest left in a couple decades. Like not, not like no pristine forest, so I mean like no forests, like virtually nothing. Um, so it looks like, looks like this. So this area on the left is deforested and there's still some grass. The area on the right is uh, an extreme case of a quarry where we've actually, not only have we deforested, we've devegetated the landscape. And so that's what's happening here. So when the next thing comes along, the resiliency of the ecosystem is that much reduced, right? So when the rain comes, if this was all forest, the rain would kind of hit here and, and you know, go in the ground, follow the roots in the ground and do some stuff, whatever. But now this is much easier to run off, and certainly in an area like this, there is nothing. It's just on rock, right? So th there's literally nothing to go into. So the water 100% runs off the surface, and you get flash flooding and all kinds of problems like that. Um, and so then the 2010 earthquake hits, um, kills 200,000 people, um, uh, uh, most likely, right? So hard to... Hard to get, when we start to get to these numbers, especially in, in countries like Haiti that don't have a robust health care infrastructure, it gets very hard to know, but, but we're talking on the order of about 200,000 people probably died. Um, and we've not, and the country has not recovered from this. So the 2008 was really bad. This, this basically um, is pretty close to the final straw. So that's what we have today. So um, uh, the earthquake that struck near the capital, Port-au-Prince, was the strongest in about, we, we estimate, 200 years. So it was a very strong, it wasn't just a regular old earthquake, it was quite devastating. And to happen in the capital where the government has its headquarters and logistics hubs and all that kind of stuff was even more problematic. Um, uh, we've had other things since, like Hurricane Matthew and other storms, and it just, it just erases stuff now. We don't really, we unfortunately don't have the capacity to rebuild and recover, it's basically pull folks out and, and um, try to get them some food, and that, that's about it. Um, in 2021, some, some gunmen, and we still don't fully understand what happened, stormed the presidential, um, the president's home and assassinated the president in the middle of the night. Um, his wife survived, uh, uh, and, and so these are headlines from the last couple days. Um, uh, it's, it's a, a investigation in Haiti has just um, charged many people, including the former president's wife, with assassinating him. So it's, it's all crazy. It's hard to know what, what the heck's going on there. And then just two days ago, um, over here, um, uh, these gangs broke into the um, 
largest prison in the country and broke out all the prisoners. And so now the the folks that were in jail are pretty much like, yep, I want to run the country. So it, it literally has become chaos. And so disasters absolutely play into this, right? Now disasters didn't cause all this, right? We have all this other stuff that poverty, everything that was laying the groundwork, but disasters are clearly the spark that drives things over the edge where people are like, hey, I need help. I'm not getting any help, et cetera. So, um, so again, the, the disasters are really, really important, and we need to be paying attention to disasters. In your life, you need to be paying attention to disasters and the long tail of the, the, these disasters because they re it really covers more than just ESRM. It covers more than just biology. It covers a whole bunch of stuff. And, uh, and so, again, disasters, I think we can view them as stressors, and we'll talk about a couple other examples of this, but, but this stuff really touches on all of us, touches on our economics, touches on uh, you know, environmental justice, all these things. Cool? Questions? Okay, all right.